Hello, everyone. Uh, Dr. Joe Ramos here today with uh, my second favorite doctor, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Don Cooper, and uh, a wonderful colleague and personal friend of mine. Thanks for doing the podcast today. My pleasure. So Dr. Cooper and I were talking. Uh, we get caught in all these deep conversations, and uh, we were talking recently about, oh, man, we need to do a podcast on that. And then we talk more, but we need to do a podcast on that. And, <laughs> and, and I think what we kind of decided prior to today is we're going to start doing this regularly, hopefully every yeah. week. Yeah, okay. that would be great. Be nice. So Dr. Cooper and I um, are both very interested in uh, obviously many areas of medicine. One of the areas that uh, Dr. Cooper heads up here in our law firm at Ramos Law, he is the director of our vaccine injury program. And one of the exciting things you were telling me about were a bunch of new developments there. I'm gonna ask you some questions about that so that we can kind of inform our audience of some of the latest, uh, greatest news in vaccine injury. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I'm going to lay a little foundation for uh, the vaccine injury compensation program and what it is. Uh, and please interrupt me if you uh, go for it. have something along the way that you find that you're like, ah, oh, we need to tell them this. Mm -hmm. We gotta, we, I know you have all those good juicy details always when we're talking, so hopefully you have some in this as well. So the foundation is this, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program uh, was developed in 1986. It was created by Congress then and actually went into effect in 1988. Um, and why? Why was your vaccine injury program created? Uh, the reason is, I'll, I'll ask the question that I'll answer, and, and again, Dr. Cooper, if you can add to this, please do. Mm -hmm. um, there were a bunch of injuries occurring related to vaccination, and uh, it was becoming a real notable problem, uh, particularly at that time with the DPT uh, vaccination, uh, di diphtheria, pertussis, uh, tetanus uh, vaccination. And um, because of this overwhelming number of complications and people presenting to attorneys with these complications, uh, the doctors that were administering these or their offices began to get sued and the, the manufacturers began to get sued. What happened was uh, people were compensated because they needed help for what they were going through, the medical complications, and these cases mounted so rapidly that some vaccine manufacturers quit making vaccines. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, with the DPT, it got down to one maker at that point, which was pretty fascinating. Congress said, hey, we need to do something about this. Uh, providers are not gonna wanna give vaccines. Um, uh, manufacturers not gonna wanna make vaccines. And, uh, and frankly, with all the injuries, people are not gonna wanna get them if we don't make this process safer. So they started funding um, this fund to take care of all of those problems. And how they decided to do it to make the to make it a very predictable expense, they started charging 75 cents on top of every vaccination that would go into a fund. So for example, if Merck, a uh, vaccine maker, um, you know, made 100 vaccinations, they would pay 75 cents for each of those for $75 into the fund. Mm -hmm. And then that fund was used to compensate injured people and it was what we call a no fault system. And what no fault means is basically, look, we're not saying the doctor was at fault, we're not saying the manufacturer was at fault, but we are acknowledging that there's an injury here. And for this injury, we're gonna allow people to tap into this fund and be compensated and be taken care of. Um, now, uh, Dr. Cooper, I know that as the director of the Vaccine Injury uh, Compensation Program here, you're very familiar with the vaccines that uh, pay into this. What are some of the more common ones that you're aware of that um, may help fund this Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund? So these are all of the childhood uh, vaccines that kids have to get when they go to school. So there's a whole list of, there's probably 20 or 30 different types and they keep updating it. Um, but some common ones are the seasonal um, influenza, yes. the quadrivalent, uh, bivalent, um, those are covered. Um, one that's not covered is that the COVID vaccines are not yet covered. Mm. So that's, that's something that recently um, where it, it's, it's looking to, right now that's covered under a separate program. Okay. Um, but that program, it looks, that, it looks like Congress is going to have is paved the way to allow COVID vaccines into this vaccine injury compensation program. So that's kind of exciting. Yeah, that was one of the new things we were talking about. I'm gonna to touch on that in just a minute. Uh, as far as uh, some of the common vaccinations, you said some of the common kind of childhood vaccinations and things we may have all received at some point when we traveled to another country so for example hepatitis a and b mm -hmm. that would fall into it right. influenza tetanus tetanus uh -huh. um measles mumps rubella yeah measles mm -hmm. mumps, rubella. there's another common polio uh, vaccinations that's probably. right what about you know there's a lot of talk about varicella um uh and stuff with the uh, whole idea uh, that that they're trying to prevent that now through vaccination that i'm sure would fall into it as well yeah it should and HPV, that's another common one you may have heard about there. So mm -hmm. many of them that fall into this. Now, um, tell me a little bit before we, I, want, I don't wanna to go to quite to COVID yet, we're gonna save that towards the end. 
But one of the new uh, things, uh, pieces of information you had informed me about was the funding of, uh, from the 75% cents, 75 cents, that is, per vaccination that's gone into this fund. Now that's built up quite a bit, and you had told me some of the numbers of it, like uh, what it had built to and how much had been paid out. Uh, right, so back then, I guess it started off with about $4 billion. It has $4 billion in it right now. They tend to spend off the interest of it, so they spend about $50 million a year uh-huh. on compensation. Um, they've paid out about $4 billion. And so right now they're they're just looking to um, recently they've there's a um, omnibus spending bill that's that's about to pass yes. 1.7 trillion dollars and part of that they're increasing the funding for that for about 32 million dollars to go into this program so it looks like finally after all the hurdles that have been put in place to get new vaccines into this program some of those hurdles are the FDA has to has to review it so it's reviewed they've reviewed all of the uh, the new code COVID vaccines um, and approve them for kids six months to five years. Yes. And so that was the main criteria of, of how they were funding this is when children are, um, when they're recommended to get those and pregnant women are recommended to get it by the CDC, then there's that 75 cent surcharge that they start. But Congress has to, to make some kind of, of action. And it looks like uh, maybe as soon as tomorrow, we may see the, the funding put in place to allow that to happen. Wow. So. Uh, and through that funding, I guess 75 cents at a time were to $4 billion. Mm-hmm. Incredible. That's a lot of vaccinations given. So tell me, what is the process um, uh, for, r- run me through the point of someone's vaccinated mm-hmm. and then um, they begin to feel like something's wrong. What, yeah. would be the, what would be the process or what's the standard one you see whereby people suffer an injury from a vaccination and, and, and how does that go from the time of vaccination to, let's just say, them calling us? Well, usually what happens, especially with these, these new mRNA uh, vaccinations, they're, they're quite effective at activating the immune system. Mm-hmm. But uh, because they're so effective at activating the immune system, they also come with some adverse effects. And those adverse effects, the primary um, adverse effects are headaches. There can be some soreness in their arms, um, fatigue. Uh, insomnia. These are these are um, they're kind of flu-like symptoms, mm-hmm. and they last for a couple days usually. And a large fraction of the people have these. Maybe uh, maybe up to sixty percent of people, when, even when they get yes. um, uh, you know the vaccine. And that's that's opposed to say if you go to get a seasonal flu shot, or maybe maybe twenty percent of the people will report something. So it, there does see it does seem to be uh, more severe in terms of an acute. A reaction, okay. um, but we aren't we aren't really seeing those those types of people. We're seeing people who where it goes. Usually, the people we see it, they have a pretty um, hard time with the, in the first few days. They experience all of those things: migraine, headaches, insomnia, muscle soreness. But then, what happens is another phase, and that second phase is in the next week or two weeks. Uh, what you start to see is. Uh, um, Changes is some neuropathy, some tingling in the extremities, some numbness. Um, there'll be heart rate uh, fluctuations, um, elevated heart rate called tachycardia. Mm. Um, there's some people have um, just hard time with uh, blood pressure fluctuations. So there's vascular. It seems to me that there's vascular issues mm. involving blood pressure and cardiac. And then there's also some neuropathy issues, which involves uh, tingling and pain sensations that tend to move around a bit. And those usually persist in order to, to be eligible for this program. They have to be serious adverse effects and that the serious injuries that last for at least six months. Okay. So all the people that we see, they have usually escalating issues where they see their doctors within, usually it's about two weeks. They, they try to get in um, and it's, it's necessary for them to get in right away. If they're having these effects, they need to get in there. They need to document that they've got these injuries. And then um, usually those injuries, they, they go through a series of different diagnostics and, and they can persist for a year, two years. Um, we, have, we run the range of, of, uh, of symptoms um, in people. Now, and, and let me make sure I understand this correctly. So because I've had a lot of the uh, symptoms that you suggested uh, in the past. I remember being vaccinated uh, to go over to Africa, uh, South Africa on a trip, and mm-hmm. just seemed like I received shots in every- the Yellow fever or something, Everything, right? yeah. I received all kinds of different uh, updated vaccinations and so on and so forth. And um, I remember feeling somewhat um, feverish, a little bit sore, a little bit flu-like for a couple of days. Yeah. Um, the difference here, it sounds like, is then when that 
persists and escalates. And it escalates then, you mentioned, um, kind of activates the immune system. Put that, or hyperactivates the immune system, I think you said early on. Yeah. Uh, explain that a little bit better. Okay, so what the, what the vaccines are designed to do is to mimic what happens naturally to the body when it experiences a, vac- experience a virus. Okay. The virus comes in, um, that's it's the, the binding site where the antibodies are, are um, detecting the virus. It's called an antigen um, antibody binding site. And the vaccines mimic that. So the part of the protein that's on the outer surface of the vaccine is called a spike protein. And the manufacturers of, the, of at least Moderna and Pfizer, most of the vaccines, if not all, use that outer um, protein coating of the spike. They take a portion of that and they grow up, um, they use that as a, as a target for the, for the immune system to recognize. And then when it recognizes the virus, it's already been trained by the, by the vaccine. Oh, and gotcha. so the vaccine is capable of activating two components. It's one is in an innate immune system where that involves um, inflammatory markers and things that prepare the body to fight off a virus. Uh, these are things like cytokines. People have probably heard of cytokine storms where sometimes you have an, a, an inflammatory response that's due to hyperactivation of the immune system. Um, and then secondary, there's a T cell response where you get um, T cells that recognize infected cells and it's their job to um, to destroy those and signal those cells to be destroyed. So you have kind of two components. One is a neutralizing um, antibody approach where they it actually goes out and tries to kill the virus as it circulates. And Another one is kind of a cleanup system that kills the cells that are infective that the T cells are doing. Both work together and both have different time courses of onset. So when you get a vaccine, you know, they tell you to wait a couple weeks before you get in a, that second component. Mm-hmm. What they're doing is they're seeding, you're, you're, you're injecting a portion of the virus that's that's uh, inactive, and then the body has time to recognize that. It usually takes about two weeks. Then you have circulating an- neutralizing antibodies. Mm-hmm. Then thereafter, if you then hit it again with another vaccine, then that, that boosts the production again. And then you have a full complement. It's called fully vaccinated um, to that particular um, viral strain. And we started with alpha, now we're in like Omicron, some number. Right. Um, and so with each, each time it mutates, the initial vaccine that they targeted, that initial portion of the spike protein um, changes, it, it's, it mutates. And so only it's partially recognized. So you can go from something that's a vaccine that's 90% effective at keeping people out of the hospital to 5% when, as, the, as the virus mutates. Okay, now let me, let me repeat what you just said to make sure that our audience understands this. So essentially when, when people are vaccinated, we're giving them a very small amount of a weakened but real substance in most cases that the body then recognizes and we train it. I like mm-hmm. what you said, how you worded that. We're training the body how to kill that. Mm-hmm. So that when it gets infected by the real thing, it's, it's ready to go, mm-hmm. it's revved up. Is this process then when we talk about inflammation cascades, when we talk about cytokines, when we talk about uh, T cells and, and the different uh, aspects of how our body responds, is that, um, is it just a, when, when people get injured then by these uh, vaccinations, with, again, what the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program is about, is, is it because their system over-prepares for the battle? I think that's an active area of research. And I think that the consensus that's, that's coming out right now is that there is what's called a hyperactivation of the immune system. Okay. They designed these, you know, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, they designed these <clears throat> mRNA, these novel, these are novel um, vectors for delivering vaccines. Never before have they used uh, on this scale uh, mRNA based vaccines and they are extremely effective at inducing a response in the immune system. So they're designed to to do that. Yeah, they're designed to basically get this response and then this response that the body does then results in when you said neuropathy you mean problems in the neurologic system. Right. You know, vasculopathies or problems with the vascular system. Right. Um, and that can run from anything from um, multiple sclerosis to Guillain-Barre to peripheral nerve. These are, these are uh, damage to they are autoimmune uh, diseases where the body attacks itself. And, then, and specifically for neuropathies, some neuropathies, um, it attacks the, the sheath that, uh, um, that insulates the conduction of nerve cells. It allows the nerve, nerve signal to go from your brain down to your, to your pinky. Um, that has to be insulated so it doesn't short circuit. Right. And if you take away that outer protein coating, because you've got antibodies attacking it, then it short circuits and that signal can't get there. And that, that results in numbness, inability to move 
properly or, or phantom uh, sensations. Got it. Now, here at uh, in the law firm, um, as the director of our um, vaccine injury uh, program, we are taking in cases that are well known of vaccine injuries uh, from some some of the common ones we've mentioned before, from influenza, the hepatitis, and so on and so forth. We've also been taking in COVID-related injury, COVID vaccination-related injuries, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not yet approved. Mm -hmm. uh, explain a little bit of that to the audience about um, the approval process. I know we touched on this earlier, but I want to be very clear with what's expected there. And mm -hmm. and then I'm going to actually ask you to maybe even guess a little bit as to, uh, you know, do you think the, vac you know, the COVID vaccinations will be approved and why would you guess how you would? So let's start uh, first back up here. First question is, um, with COVID, why is that vaccine not approved under the injury program? Well, they they set up two different programs. Um, one program is called the Countermeasures um, Injury Compensation Program, or CSEP. It covers um, things like anthrax. It's, it's meant to cover experimental um, vaccinations or treatments that maybe um, soldiers might find. Um, that's very rare mm -hmm. and so um, that it's kind of an interim program that uh, hasn't really paid out anything yet and there's been thousands of people who have submitted claims to it but um, so far it hasn't really paid out so we don't actually think that that's a viable program um, <coughs> and it just takes time to get into the v to the vaccine the VICP program and there are a number of hurdles um, the hurdles um, the, the first you have to you know how you have an emergency use authorization that that Pfizer Moderna went through yes. in order to allow people to take it there's that first level of, of safety. And then it, they have to continue going down in order to be eligible for this program. They have to then approve it for, for kids down all the way down to six months of age to five. And, you know, if people have been following this, you've seen that it went to teenagers and then it went to five and up and then now it's down to six months to five-year-olds. Yes. So it's past the FDA hurdle. Got it. Now, the second thing is the CDC. The CDC has to recommend it for, for as a routine administration for kids when they go to school. That's happened. And they also have to recommend it for, for use in pregnant women. And that's happened. Mm. So in terms of the regulatory side, it's, it's very rapidly, more rapidly than any other vaccine in the past, um, has, has passed those hurdles. The only remaining hurdle would be the funding mechanism and the, and the administrative side to allow it into the program coming from the Secretary of, of Health. So, so to get into the program as a covered vaccine injury agent, so to say, it, it's age-based, I heard. It's um, administration-based where it has to be able, for example, to be administered to pregnant um, uh, women. Um, there's a funding issue that goes with it. Mm -hmm. and, and then the time to get through the regulatory process. Now, one of the new pieces of news you told me right before we started today mm -hmm. was you mentioned this funding that was part of the recent... Um, uh, bill. I go into a little bit of detail on that. On the, I think. Did you say the total bill was like one point something trillion? Dollars? One point seven trillion. It's the it's the end of year omnibus spending bill that uh, that keeps the government going for another you know until September I think. And my understanding is in your review of that that not only is that set to essentially hopefully pass tomorrow, but there's a portion of that that has been set aside that looks like it's been earmarked. For, That's right. for this. And what is that? Right. They put they put aside roughly thirty two million dollars in order to um, increase funding for this program. Wow. So they're expecting uh, part of that's an administrative increase of, a, of about 15 percent and then also direct um, direct spending. So they're expecting um, for reasons that they don't really go into. It's just a line item on the bill. But but um, we're expecting that, that they're they're expecting an increase in in something as part of that program. And the only th really new thing that's happened would be the the covid vaccines. Wow. So. Um I, I, the other part to my question a minute ago is I'm going to ask you to predict then, in your opinion, based on what yeah. you're seeing, mm -hmm. is COVID going to be approved for this? And why would you opine as you do? Oh, I think so. I mean, I've been telling people, I think in the first quarter of, of next year, um, simply because it's it's been marching through all the statutory requirements that a vaccine needs to mm -hmm. um, at, at a lightning pace. Yes. And um, I think that there is, there is um, enough... Um, well, enough people who are who are speaking out. There's a lot of skepticism um, over the past couple of years about mandates, and it's people are speaking out 
who've had injuries and they want some answers. And right now, I mean, imagine a scenario where we don't, where we don't um, honor um, that that program and the government doesn't provide for that program. I mean, other countries have done. Canada has passed it. Taiwan has passed it. Um, several other countries have passed. Uh, similar compensation programs. And we have ours in place. It's largely regarded in a bipartisan way as a successful program. Mm -hmm. So um, I see that that eventually, you know, maybe in the few next, like I say, in the first quarter, I'm expecting that it will be, um, it'd be admitted. Wow. Wow. That's exciting. And, and I, uh, I would say the one thing I really like uh, about the program, you mentioned it being largely successful. The thing I like about the vaccine injury compensation program is the no fault aspect. I like the fact that mm -hmm. uh, we're not discouraging companies from making vaccinations because essentially there's no lawsuit that they're going to face as a result of, of a vaccination because compensation is going to come from a fund mm -hmm. uh, that's been essentially taxed at 75 cents per vaccination. I like that doctors have no fear um, as well. They don't have to worry uh, themselves about being blamed because someone got, you know, had an adverse effect from a vaccination. Mm -hmm been compensated for in the fund and, and I think that that no fault nature of it I would agree makes it a very successful program now next thing I, I, I wanted to ask you was so if someone thinks they're injured through vaccination we, we ran through that scenario earlier where they get a vaccination they have a couple days of symptoms of fever and soreness and aches uh, that's not the time to be calling in and claiming injury um, but then a person let's say that their symptoms escalate and mm -hmm. they start to feel numbness or weakness or you know, difficulty moving their arm or uh, they have other symptoms. Um, run us through what a patient should do from, I have my vaccination today and a week from now, I'm starting to feel some numbness or tingling in, in my my right hand. Yeah. What, what would you say? What's the first step they should do? Well, usually these these symptoms are not subtle. So in, in the instinct from talking to all of the people that I've talked to, um, usually they try to tough it out. They say, well, yeah, I've expected I'm going to feel lethargic for a couple days. Um, and then when it persists and it gets worse, um, some people go to the doctor and they do everything they can to figure out what's going on and other people continue just to wait and see if it gets worse. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, the ones that go to the doctor or try to get assistance, I think, are better off because yes. I think it's, it's very important. If you make the decision to get vaccinated, then you should be very vigilant about any, any changes that you observe in any system, gastrointestinal, if it's urinary system, muscular, neurological, if there's more brain fog, if you're having blood pressure issues, um, anything, you should be very vigilant about um, these things and make sure that you immediately go get some kind of treatment or you try to, you try to get some diagnosis. Yes. You may not be able to get a treatment. They may um, <clears throat> give you something that might make you feel better with a, a non steroidal anti-inflammatories or something like that. But what, you re what we really notice is that over the next few days and weeks, um, things get much worse and people get to the point where they, they can't go to work um, and they, they can't function. And um, sometimes we have people who have strokes um, within a few days after getting the vaccines. We've had a few people who've passed away. So this is, it can be very serious. And so before you call, you know, an attorney, you know, I would say call your doctor and Absolutely. just get a healthcare provider and make sure that you're documenting what's going on. You're, you're taking notes about your, your physiology and what's changing, making sure that um, you're able to tell the doctors exactly what's happening to you. Yeah, I, I, boy, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Call the doctor as soon as possible and report what you're experiencing and get it documented, um, and not for sake of a, of a claim, but for sake of your own health. Mm -hmm. As you said, we've had people that stroked, people who have died, mm -hmm. people with serious blood clots. Um, and uh, the sooner that that is diagnosed, uh, which only happens through talking to your doctor, reporting it to your doctor, and the, the kind of the proximity, proximity in time to that vaccination is critical later for us if a claim is made, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, um, I've heard you talk to people who've called in before, uh, questioning if they've been injured by a vaccination or not, and uh, kind of picking your mind um, on this subject. And I've heard you talk to them about uh, filing a VAERS report. Mm -hmm. uh, VAERS meaning Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Mm -hmm. um, what is that all about? Well, that's a program that um, 
the FDA and the CDC set up as part of the requirements for um, emergency use authorization. So um, FDA allows a uh, vaccine to be administered on a, an emergency use basis, but they need to have the ability to, to still pick up on a safety signal in the population once it's out. So if they deem that something is critical, it has to be released before all the clinical trials can be, can be done. So let's say this happened in, in I think the, the COVID vaccines were approved in nine months. The fastest prior to that was four years. Right. So if they're gonna say, we need to give everyone in the country um, a shot, and we're going to do that with with not all the 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 clinical data that they need. Then they need to have a, what's called a post marketing review process. They have to be able to to still detect if some signals out there where someone's getting injured and they didn't pick it up in the thirty thousand people that they had in the clinical trials. Mm. And so that process is if anything happens, anything at all. Um, you're in a car accident after you get vaccine, uh, get a vaccination, then that should be reported. They say anything at all that happens that may or may not be caused by the vaccine shot should be reported. And so the the um, and it's actually part of the condition of the emergency use authorization is to file that. So the healthcare providers have to do that. The, the physicians, um, it's their responsibility to to file that. It's the, the person's responsibility uh, to do that. Primarily, though, it's the it's the person who whatever, whoever it is that's delivering the vaccine needs to take responsibility for filing that. And then the CDC looks at that, and they look at all of this this data that's coming in, and people are reporting. Um, uh, you know, you know whatever is happening to them. It could be a car, like I said, it could be a car accident. Some could, somebody could commit suicide afterwards, and it could be completely unrelated. But they have to look at that signal and say, okay, we, we're starting to see that, for example, pulmonary embolisms are higher in 18-year-old men mm -hmm. for whatever reason. So the CDC has some ideas to what the base rate of pulmonary embolisms are in you know 18-year-old men, mm -hmm. and if that goes up by 10 percent based on what's reported in VAERS, that's gonna be a safety signal. That means they're gonna go back, they're gonna follow up on it, and they're gonna make sure, is this something real or not? So the VAERS system, is it just an online form that's completed then? That's right. And and it sounds to me like they use this online form is almost like using the population as kind of a study group. They are. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> well, it's it's yeah. you can look at it that way and people can, can say, well, you know, we're all guinea pigs. But <laughs> it, in reality, it's kind of a surveillance program to make sure that, the, that they can detect um, signals that maybe, you know, one in a one in a million, you know, one in a hundred thousand. And so yes. the vaccine injuries tend to be about one in 30,000, something like that. Okay. So in order to do that, you have to do a, a large scale reporting system. You're going to get a lot of noise, but the point is to try to pick out the signal. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Now tell me uh, with what we're seeing here. Um, I know that all day, every day, you're working with a population of people who feel like they've been injured uh, through the vaccination process and they, they reach out to, to Ramos Law here mm -hmm. and you provide them direction. Uh, what are you seeing the most common uh, categories or groups of injuries so far? And, and let's relate this to, to COVID specifically. What are you seeing uh, most often? Most often, I think we're seeing uh, vascular issues, vasculitis, um, people who have you know, what's known as POTS, um, they have this or this rapid changes in in heart rate when they go from seated position to standing um, So there's a heart racing for no apparent reason fluctuations in blood pressure um, We see stroke um, we've seen some cardiac um, uh, Swelling in the pericardium um, so we were generally I'd say most of them are are vascular and then a close second would be neuropathy mm -hmm. and those would be uh, strange tingling sensations, burning sensations, pain um, in the extremities. And those could also be vasculitis. So those two things, that these are just the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for doctors to, <laughs> to diagnose these. It takes a lot, of, um, a lot of diagnostics in order to really identify um, multi-system issues, a lot of autonomic dysregulation as well. In both of the vascular and the neuropathy, I would say autonomic dysregulation is something that's very common. And that means things that are just autonomic, the nervous system takes care of in an autonomic fashion, digestion, um, sleep, things like that become more blood pressure, heart rate, all those things are automatically regulated. Um, those 
tend to fluctuate for, for no apparent reason. And that causes people to be concerned and it, it causes pain. And, um, and so that's, the, that's kind of the primary signal that, that people have. Yeah, and, and for, for our audience to be listening, I know, I know sometimes Dr. Cooper and I, two doctors sitting here talking, we can uh, sometimes say things uh, that we understand very well. It's, it's like its own little language between doctors, but the audience may not. I'm really glad you explained the autonomic nervous system in that way. Really, I've always looked at it in the, in the simplest form of uh, just the things that happen automatically mm-hmm. without us really realizing it. Uh, we blink or we um, we breathe or our heart beats or when we go to stand up, our vessels uh, constrict to prevent blood from going to our periphery. Yeah. Uh, they keep it central. Uh, a lot of these things happen just automatically. And uh, we don't have to think about making our vessels contract or contract our muscles to do that. It just happens. And when, when you get those systems you know, out of whack, out of balance. When we start not to have that natural ability to control many of these functions, it is life changing. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's kind of like when somebody gets anyone who's been sick with the flu for, you know, really, a, um, um, with, with severe effects of the flu where it just lays you out for days, mm-hmm. you know, you have the fever, you lose your appetite, you know, you have nausea, all of those things. Those are the kind of, that's the kind of severity that we're dealing with, but this is lasting for months. Wow. Now when, when, um, gosh, there's so much to talk about. I wanted to keep our talk today to 30 minutes. <laughs> we're, we're at that now. There's, there's, I, I want to find a way to, to bring this to a close. Um, but, but I just have so many more topics here to go over with you in this area. Um, well, in fact, maybe this would be a good way to kind of close today out. Um, and, and for the audience, anybody that's out there, if you have a particular question or a particular area you'd like us to go into, or even go into uh, deeper where we really break down the science and, uh, and such, we love doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So please feel free to message us or comment uh, uh, you know, on our blog or, or our website or uh, go in and let us know because we're here as a service and we, we want people to learn and, and grow from this. And I, I think as part of, of maybe the growing, you've explained some of the, the common uh, stuff. One of the things I wanted to cover in the future, maybe we don't cover it today. One of the most common things that seemed to be vaccine related, at least pre-COVID, um, was the concept of serva. Um, Serva stands for shoulder injury related to vaccine administration. Uh, again, shoulder injury related to vaccine administration. Mm-hmm. I think probably be worth us talking about that at some point in the future um, and, and kind of how it happens and what happens there. I think it's a little bit different mm-hmm. uh, in, in its own ways. Um, uh, what are some things that you'd like to see us talk about? And we'll throw some of these out as ideas and, and maybe it'll get someone, uh, a listener to comment. And on no, don't do that, or yes, do that. Is there particular areas uh, in this in this conversation you'd like to see us explore more? No, the thing that strikes me when I'm talking to people who are suffering from these injuries is um, what comes through loud and clear um, is the frustration that they feel with the general medical community and um, and the fact that they feel like doctors tend to be dismissive. Yes. And, um, and I, I, I understand that when they're describing their symptoms and they're, they're for the, for the large part, they're multi-system disorders. They're, yes. they're involving insomnia, gastrointestinal, um, rash, you know, strange, uh, tingling sensations that move from one leg to the other. I mean, it's so many different things all together with so many different systems that can really only be explained by an immune system and inflammatory cascades. And that means they're going to, to different doctors, rheumatologists, immunologists, cardiologists, and, and neurologists. And the way that our medical system is so siloed is that there's not a lot of crosstalk between experts. Mm. So they're having a very, very difficult time having somebody explain to them how all this can be happening. So I spend a lot of time talking to people about how it is that, that all these different systems can communicate with one another and why, trying to explain to them why their doctors might have this attitude of being dismissive. And I, I think that's something that maybe you could speak to um, either now or in our, yeah. our, next, um, our next show. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great way for me to wrap up today is to, is to speak to that uh, exactly that dismissive approach from the medical community towards people who are suffering from these injuries. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, as a practitioner myself in a university system, 
very busy for you know close to 10 years and then five years with a private hospital uh, work mm -hmm. i saw many people who had what we would call multi-system complaints mm -hmm. and doctors tend to um probably well not probably definitely wrongfully so over time become prejudiced to hey look only so many systems can be bothered by a particular process so for example if you have a pneumonia um, your big toe doesn't ache too. Uh, if you have a, a headache, uh, your, yeah. you know, your left knee doesn't ache too. Right. Uh, it's been this attitude that you're taught through medical school and through training um, and such. And so sometimes the more systems that somebody presents with wrong, the more dismissive that we become mm -hmm. as a medical community. Interesting. The other thing is, is that we forget sometimes as doctors too, we become callous in these busy hospital systems with a lot of patients. Um, that we don't always have the knowledge for in each area, we become dismissive of things that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also taught at a baseline in our training, you know, part of a, of a note, as you learned, you know, Dr. Cooper, through, through training, you know, chief complaint. It's like, what is the person complaining with chief complaint? They don't call it chief concern. Mm -hmm. They call it complaint. Yeah. So doctors begin to look at this as, oh, what are they complaining about now, mm -hmm. right? And this leads also to this dismissive attitude amongst providers. I think the thing that I've found most phenomenal in working with you uh, through this process is that um, you have to listen to every one of these concerns, and there is a system tie-in for it, mm -hmm. and there's a very good explanation for it. It takes a little bit more listening. It takes not being dismissive, and we can't let you know the callousness of, callousness of our time and training and how we were taught to treat these like complaints. We can't allow the sheer number of patients that uh, we see to um, make us want to rush to move on to the next one, mm -hmm. we also can't um, we we can't forget that because we don't understand something, it doesn't mean that we dismiss it. We, yeah. have, you know, we refer on to somebody who does, and so those are I, I think some of the main reasons I've seen the medical system develop this approach as it has, and it's one of the more rewarding things in working on this with you through this program is um, uh, we don't dismiss them. Mm -hmm. we, we look for an answer and and we're finding answers uh one of the things i, I think we'll kind of uh, maybe throw a little teaser out there for the audience on on a future show uh dr cooper and i are working extensive on some uh genome uh, stuff you want to mm -hmm. give a give a little teaser for that dr cooper here on what we're going to talk about in the future with that and what we're finding there oh that's very exciting um yeah it is. if you think about it um back in 2010 it was 10 million dollars to sequence a human genome wow in 2001 it was 100 million and now we can do it for about 200 dollars wow and so the the time that it's that it's the the amount of information that we can get from from looking at a person's entire genome sequencing you only have to do it once and we've got the code. And then as more research is developed, we find that there are certain, um, certain genes that are in the immune system or in the vascular system and their neuro neuro neurological system that code for proteins that make someone more vulnerable to different aspects of an, either infectious, infectious diseases or vaccines. And so it's this combination of a genetic vulnerability combined with uh, a vaccine that we feel that um, can explain why someone who's you know, a 16-year-old might present with a stroke. I mean, that just never happens. But if they have an underlying uh, genetic vulnerability, then now we're starting to put the pieces together. Yeah, and, and uh, kind of add to that teaser. I mean, that's so well said. But to add to that, uh, and I, I have a hard time hiding my excitement here. I'm like a little kid wants to open a Christmas <laughs> present or, yeah, yeah. early, a month but early. Um, Dr. Cooper and I are finding uh, in this genomic profiling that we're doing of people, we are finding pieces of the puzzle that fit together. Absolutely. They're explaining a lot. And so please listen in the near future because we are going to go over that. Absolutely. That, that, that may be very well be the very next program we do because it's just so exciting. And we already have a lot on it that we could share today and go another hour. I also want to share in the future, as I said, on the survey injuries, those shoulder injuries. Um, I want to share a little bit in the future on what we're seeing for compensation to injured people. Mm -hmm. through some of these. Uh, I've got some examples of yep. compensation that, that uh, we've seen from a lot related, like the influenza vaccine and such with various conditions, just to give people an idea of what's out there. And, and lastly, just want to remind everyone that uh, the purpose of today's show is not to say um, that, you know, if you get a vaccine and you have an adverse effect that we're here to sue somebody, that is not the message. Uh, the message is that with anything in medicine that we do, there are adverse effects. Mm-hmm. And we see that um, 
in every area of medicine, not just vaccines. And, and fortunately, there's been a fund set up that doesn't hold anybody responsible. It's no fault. It's funded at the 75 cents per vaccination. You heard Dr. Cooper say earlier that there's a, a $4 billion in this fund. Mm -hmm. uh, the fund pays out to help people with using the interest of it. We also heard Dr. Cooper say that as recently as tomorrow, we're expecting a, this omnibus bill to pass with additional funding. I think he said 32 more million dollars mm -hmm. going into a fund. And, and really the exciting news that um, at least it looks like from the best of what we see that uh, people that are suffering adverse consequences from COVID vaccination may be covered here in the very near future. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to the summary? But with that, I'd like to, to wrap up here today, but I, I welcome any comments from, from you if there's something you, you feel like. Would no, be nice that, was, that was excellent. It was a well, pleasure. It's been a pleasure as always. Love, uh, love working with you, Dr. Cooper. Love uh, uh, talking medicine with you. And uh, let's start sharing this with our audience here and try to do it every week for all yeah. of 2023. Awesome. It's a deal. Yeah. Take care. Thanks again for listening today.